Welcome to the GP Llama YouTube channel and to some brand new bike tech. A few weeks back, IGP Sport announced a new flagship cycling GPS unit, the IGS 800. And today, one has landed here in the Llama Lab. IGP Sport have been in the bike computer game for over 10 years now, and this is their latest offering with quite an impressive list of specifications. Now, as this has only just landed today, this video will be a look at the specifications, an unboxing, and some hands-on here on the bench with the initial setup and configuration. It will take a few weeks of riding out on the trails and gravel and road to get to know this unit, at which time I'll do a full in-depth review. Okay, let's get to the technical specifications of what's in here. Now, this isn't listed on their website officially at this point in time. However, IGP Sport have published a few things here and there, which I'll summarize here. They claim a stunning three and a half inch full color screen, sleek design for maximum speed, rapid multi-frequency GPS positioning. I have some more details on that in just a moment. Precise navigation for every ride, over 50 hours of extended battery life. Now I've bolded extended battery life because I think what they're claiming there is the battery save mode. And at 50 hours, that's equivalent to a few other units that are out there on the market. A lot of people in the forums have been focusing on 50 hours of battery life. I don't think 50 hours of standard use is actually the specification. I do believe that's probably sleep mode. However, this is what we'll find out. Seamless connectivity to cycling devices. And they also state pre-sales will be coming soon for this bike computer. Now, other technical specifications have been posted over on Chinatown.com, thanks to user Poyo. Now these at the moment will be unofficial specifications until we get the full listing from IGP Sport, but they look pretty close to what the IGP Sport have officially posted. Size of the unit here, 99 millimeter height, 60 mil wide, 21 mil thick. The Edge 840 is listed there as a reference point. Weight 110 grams. The display, three and a half inch color touch display, so touch screen with a resolution of 320 by 480. Again, the Edge is listed there as a reference. Six physical buttons, so both buttons and touchscreen, that's a welcome addition. Up to 50 hours of usage time. They do list the Edge 840 there as 26 hours, but there's a bit of ambiguity there on, do they mean sleep mode? Do they mean battery save mode? We'll soon find out. Supports fast charging, Bluetooth 5.1, Amp Plus, Wi-Fi, satellites, a little bit more information on this post than what we saw from IGP Sport. So multiple constellations, including Galileo, so multi-GNSS, and also multi-frequency there with L1 and L5 bands. Navigation, rerouting supported, that's all we've got listed in navigation. I hope it does a lot more than just rerouting. Climb Assistant, their version of Climb Pro, which we have seen on some of their promotions of this unit. I'm keen to check that out. Now I am hoping that is free ride Climb Pro, so not having to follow a route, something we've come to expect from high-end units and something we do see on Garmin, Wahoo and Hammerhead units. The built-in sensors here listed, accelerometer, barometric pressure, temperature, ambient light and magnetic compass. Standard third-party sensor support listed here, speed cadence, part rate, power meter, smart trainers, radar, smart light, drivetrain, so DI2, ETAP, etc. Listed there is Strava automatic sync and live segment, yes. IPX7 waterproofing, it has a speaker or a beeper on there, 32 gig of storage, which should be enough for detailed regional maps. Definitely not enough for global mapping. USB-C, woohoo! And physiology features they list here, so training status, real-time fitness monitoring, post-workout, training effect analysis, and health recovery tracking. Now those are the value adds that we see on the Garmin units after every ride, giving us an assessment of the ride we've done. Keen to see how uh, this one does it. When it comes to pricing or estimated pricing, I don't have anything concrete. All I could find was a listing here which doing the conversions is around $350 US. So that will be the unofficial ballpark we can expect to see this unit going for. Pricing and availability is something that I will confirm in my full review of this unit in a few weeks. Okay, if you fast forwarded to this part of the video, welcome to the channel and to the unboxing of the IGS 800. Very interesting looking unit. This is the Chinese box, so not a lot of English on here, and I'm yet to open it, so let's get it done. And see what's inside. Okay. Oh, okay. Now, the lack of bezels is very apparent. On that, I'll try not to shine it in the light too much. Okay, that's the unit. We have some... Oh, Froomey's, <laughs> Froomey's arrived. On here, quick start manual. We also have 
a number of other things. What have we got in here? We have mount and lanyard, fantastic. USB-C cable, fantastic. And I don't actually know what would be in here. Oh, huh. protective case and some screen protectors provided. That's an interesting little value add there. So a little rubber case. Those aside to the most interesting part, peel off the screen protector here. And there is confirmed a lot of screen. Okay, on the back side, we have what appears to be the alloy dog ears. Very similar to that of the, well, they look very similar, to be honest. It's the Edge 840 Solar. With the size just side by side here, I'd have to say those screens are almost equivalent in height width. Um, the IGP Sport has it. Just as comparison, the 840 next to it, uh, the Karoo 2, <laughs> Karoo 2 here, which has taken a bit of a tumble, and the Rome 2 as well. So let me put that one in the middle. So there's our size comparison. So without a doubt, not that you can see the screen oh, much on the Karoo there, there's a lot of screen on the IGP Sport. All right, what else do we see? So power button up the top here, two buttons down below. So we have lap, pause and go. We have the lanyard connection, USB-C connector there. All right, that's pretty obvious. Up and down here and another button up here. So a lot of function buttons as well as touch screens. Let's weigh this thing. Technical specification was 110 grams. Let's see how it goes. Oh, hang on. Close enough. <laughs> 112. And the all-important turn on for the first time. And a, a boot time of next to nothing there. Okay, just running through the setup. The screen's a little dark at the moment. Um, I sh okay, it wants me to set a time zone. Uh, I'd like that to be automatic or done via the app. We've got currently GMT plus 10 as the time zone. So I'm not sure if it's asking for the time or the time zone. Let's go, just a lot of beeps there. Let's go for, okay. And we have a QR code to start on the app. Now, at this point in time, that screen's not very white. It's a little washed out. There's a tinge of brown to it from here. Okay, I already have the app downloaded on my phone. So I'll click on that. We'll go through to kilometers meters celsius uh, 12 hour time format touch screen it used to be nice and responsive at the moment still a little dull um okay back key last page long press that's the back key okay next confirm key so that's the enter key over here lap ride long press custom mode okay swipe for more widgets swipe down status page click start right okay Oh, okay, so we are done. Time is 3.04, that is correct. Let's swipe down from the top and turn this brightness all the way up. Okay, we have automatic on or off. That's very intuitive. Screen looks still a little dull though. I am in some very, very bright lights here. Uh, GPS, precise, enable, dual frequency. Okay, so we've turned on that. That's a very Garmin feel to it. Back here, elevation, uh, calibration right here. We at about 4.30, so we want 4.30. We have the weather, which is about right. What does home take me to? Okay, back here. But very, very much a Garmin X40 feel to it right now. Okay, now in regard to pairing the phone, let's get that set up. Loading the IGP Sport app. 
device, add device, cycling product, it's already found it here, connect, allow, okay, it wants to jump on the Wi-Fi, no problem. Alrighty, it has, or it appears to have connected to it. Okay, all done there. Looks like we can configure most things from within the app here, Wi-Fi. Okay, that's all good. Firmware detecting. We are up to date. Let's just check anyway. No, we're still up to date, 105. Power management, there's our power save mode. Okay. Not a lot of detail on exactly what power save mode, writing mode. Okay, page configuration can all be done from within the app here. That all looks pretty good. Let's just go with defaults for now. Alert settings, so a lot of custom alerts there. Auto configuration, so auto records an interesting one. Auto pause, now auto lap, definitely not, thank you and different modes up here. I'd be keen to see in my in-depth review if they actually set the subsport correctly for Strava. Tracking, there is live track, as long as there's permissions turned on. So we'll look at that at a later time. But everything else here seems pretty straightforward. Let's go back and usage guide. So we have access to the English product manual here, which I will get familiar with very soon. Now the screen brightness that's fully on, okay. Has a very e-ink feel to it. Uh, as comparison, what's another bright screen we've got here? I'll turn on the, so the 1040 solar. The touchscreen does feel quite responsive. Okay, let's go for indoor on that one. Hmm. Definitely has a different kind of screen to it than the uh, the Edge unit, which may be why they're claiming such high battery life. But at this point in time, that's uh, it's a pretty impressive little unit for the touch screen. It's working quite well. Press and hold, click to switch templates. Okay. Oh wow. We can switch templates from there. How about that? Anyhow, enough of me playing. That's the first look hands-on with the IGS 800. And in the hand, it's actually a, a pretty slick feeling device. Okay, so next up, I'll be out on the road bike, the gravel bike and mountain bike on the trails with that unit to see how it holds up in the real world. Now, over the last few months or so, I've been using a lot of non-Garmin, Wahoo and Hammerhead GPS units. And I've been dealing with a lot of, well, what I would only describe as a bit of user friction, both on the unit themselves, out on the bike, and under the hood after the rides. So just some commentary on how tough the cycling computer market is. Now trying to compete with Garmin and their feature list and their entire ecosystem is a very, very tough task. And it does require more than just hardware. Now when I refer to the Garmin ecosystem, I'm also including a Garmin Connect, which is quite a powerful tool that comes with those units. It has fitness tracking, calendaring, scheduling, workouts, goals and achievements, etc. It's quite an extensive tool behind the scenes there that a lot of people don't really take into account when looking at different GPS options. Now it is worth mentioning that Wahoo have taken a big bite out of that market, offering a lot of the core functionality that cyclists want and doing it very, very well. But what I've experienced going to the cheaper or lower end GPS units is, as I mentioned before, a lot of user friction and a lot of things the other units have solved years and years ago. Just a quick list off the top of my head that I jotted down before doing the video. Um, almost zero touch route importing is now the standard on higher end units. Just the other day, I was plotting a route in Komoot for a different GPS unit that I was going to be riding with. Once I'd uh, done the process to get that route onto that unit, I was also riding with my Edge 1040. I turned that unit on and the route that I created in Komoot was already on the 1040, zero touch. It even had the map on the home screen of the latest route that was imported automatically. That's how things should be. Very, very simple. There's also now backup and restore. We do spend a lot of time customizing our devices with bike profiles, sensors, screens, our preferences. 
it takes a little time to set these up. And when doing an upgrade or maybe you have to do a factory reset, things can be a little painful. At the higher end, most units now offer a backup and restore from the cloud with their devices. A very, very convenient option. And also things such as cycle-specific bike maps. They are simply missing from some bike computers. Now we have a bike park here in Ballarat called Black Hill Mountain Bike Park. There is a bike path for everyone that goes nearby. There's a pump track for kids. There's some cross country and downhill. It's a little area of lots and lots of things happening for bikes. Now, for example, when riding past that with the Stages M200, it just simply doesn't show up on the map at all. It's a bike computer. So again, just another example of a few things on lower end computers. And yes, I would consider the Dash a lower end computer, like it or not that just aren't done the same as higher end bike computers. Now admittedly, a lot of these bike computer manufacturers will say, hey, look, we're only half the price. And while that is true, that's the answer that I get while I'm doing twice the work to get the same features out of these units as the higher end units. So pay half as much, do twice as much work. And even then, when you get to that functionality that they are claiming is equivalent, it really isn't. So I have a lot more to say on this, but I'll maybe leave that for another day as this video is about the IGS 800 and how it performs. And now it's my job to go out on the road and report back on how it does perform. Anyway, as always, with all bike technology that comes past my desk, it is entirely up to the company to release products to the market and sign off on those. Whether the product is good or bad or my experience is good or bad is entirely up to the company producing these products. If it's great, it's exactly what I'll say. If it's not, well, we'll hear about that too. Anyhow, as always, thanks for watching this one. I'll be back with a full review of this in a week or two. My expectations are still high on that unit, and I really hope it doesn't let me down. All right, as always, give this video a thumbs up if you found it informative, and remember to hit subscribe to be across any further videos uploaded to this channel, including the review of that device just there. All right, we'll see you soon.